we have a very special guest today. Uh, her name is Nicole Sachs. She is a little bit different from our previous guests. She is not per se a mindfulness expert, but she has something very, very, very powerful to share with us today. She is a licensed therapist. She is an author of a book called The Meaning of Truth, and she is the host of a podcast called The Cure for Chronic Pain. Hmm, let's learn a little bit more about that. Nicole, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. So um, this is kind of an interesting title, The Meaning of Truth and the Cure for Chronic Pain. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your work? Sure. So I came by this work honestly. I was 19 when I was diagnosed with a severe spinal condition in terrible pain. I was a freshman in college, brought home from college and told that my life was going to be severely limited, no sports, no travel. I would never have biological children. Um, just really, really kind of dark. And through learning about mind-body medicine, which is kind of what I'm going to talk about today, and the miracle of mind-body medicine that people that they never teach in school, unfortunately, but now we will start, um, that there are, there are crazy things that can happen to your body when you start attending to your emotional world. And through that and through my association with Dr. Sarno at NYU, I became a licensed therapist and that's how I became an author. I started treating people and I've been bringing people from total disability to total health for many, many years. And my own story is that I never had a surgery. I never had injections or treatments or got hooked on medication. And I had three biological children and exercise and travel. I do everything even though my spine looks exactly the same on MRI. So it's a personal story that became a professional story. And now I watch people all over the world change from my work. So just to be clear, as we have people watching here today, um, you're not telling anyone that they shouldn't be seeking medical treatment if they have uh, you know, any kind of conditions. They should still see their doctor. They should still get treated by a physician. But when some of these things don't work, you're saying that mind body medicine and what you're going to share with us today has has a profound benefit. Is that what oh, you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I am I'm a mother of three and I have two step kids. So I'm a mother of five. My kids have a sore throat. We're not which we don't have a witch's brew in the kitchen. You know, we're going to the doctor and we're getting antibiotics if they have strep throat. This is really about the millions and millions of people all over the world that have chronic something, anxiety, migraines, fibromyalgia, back pain, the things that a doctor sees you and says, okay, we've ruled out a tumor on your spine. We've ruled out, you know, any sort of thing that a real medical intervention could cure. And now it just becomes, sorry, you're on your own, or maybe there's different treatments, but none of them really work very well. And so that's where my work comes in. It's really most of the time when the, when the Western, Western medical model ends, that's where my work begins. I find it really interesting that in the same uh, grouping, you put things like migraine, headache, uh, backache, and anxiety, which most people would think would be very different things. So let's explore that in a few minutes. But yes. first, you also do, I know you lead retreats around the world where people who are sick come, you know, either mm -hmm. through anxiety, with anxiety or whatever their conditions are. Will you walk us through a meditation? I certainly will. All right, should we just begin? Yeah, let's do it. Okay, all right, everybody. So let's just close our eyes and just take a few natural breaths. Just in and out, center ourselves right here in the moment. And what we're gonna do together today is we are gonna do a visualization together to bring us to a place where we can really practice self-compassion. A lot of my work has to do with understanding the importance of self-compassion, treating yourself with the kind of love and kindness that you would treat your most cherished friend or loved one. So what we're gonna do is we're going to picture ourselves walking down a beautiful, brightly lit hallway. The walls are white, the ceilings are white, and on the walls of this hallway are pictures of the most beautiful, most pleasurable things you can imagine. Your best friends, the food you love to eat, the places you wish you could visit, everything is just beautiful. The hallway is such a peaceful place to be and we're just walking down the hallway. 
And as we look down to the end of the hallway, we see there's a door at the end of the hallway and we're gonna walk slowly, breathing in and breathing out toward this door. And as we approach the door, I want you to picture your arm and your hand extending to the doorknob. I want you to watch your hand clasp the doorknob and gently turn it and gently open up this door. And as the door opens, you realize that you've opened the door into the most beautiful outdoor scene you can imagine. So if you love the woods and a stream and beautiful light coming through the trees, you open the door and you see the scene. If you love the beach, and it doesn't have to be a place you've been, it could be a place you've seen a picture of or a place you've envisioned in your dreams, a beautiful white sand beach with crystal clear waters lapping up onto the shore, then that's where you are. Or maybe you picture yourself at the top of a mountain looking over the vast canyons and the trees and the colors. Maybe it's fall and the trees are changing and the leaves are bright, brilliant, red and orange. And I want you to just walk out into this beautiful space. And as you walk out, I want you to smell the air. I want you to feel your surroundings. I want you to feel the warm sun on your face and realize you have come to a place of complete safety, of complete peace. As you walk slowly, maybe you hear the leaves crunching under your feet or you feel the sand in your toes. And I just want you to realize that everything is safe here. The door gently closes behind you, but it's not locked. You'll always be able to come back to your life, but here you are. So as you walk slowly, you can see in the distance a place that you would like to sit down. So you're gonna move gently toward that place and you're gonna find a very comfortable, inviting place to sit. You're gonna make yourself feel cozy. You're going, and, and you know what? It's our meditation. There's a blanket there. There's a pillow there. Anything you need to feel totally safe and serene. And as you sit down, I just want you to realize how grateful you are that you get this time and this space. Nobody can bother you. Nobody you can nag at you or make you feel bad. This is your place of total peace. And when you're ready in your surroundings, I want you to close your eyes and I want you to realize that this is a space where no matter what you have done, no matter what you have said, maybe you had an argument with somebody, maybe somebody put you down, made you feel a little less than, maybe you didn't do well on a test, all those things that have been bothering you and just getting to you right here, you have time to simply be with yourself. None of those things are here with you. This is a place of total peace. This is a place where you can feel kindness toward yourself. And what's beautiful about this place is you can always come back to it. This is a place that is available to you whenever you decide to walk down that beautiful hallway and open the door and close it behind you knowing that it's not locked, that you have safety here. And so let's just sit here for a moment. Maybe put your hands on your heart. Breathe in. Let that breath come right into your heart and say, I can be kind to myself here. Within this beautiful surroundings with the sun on my face, with the wind coming through my hair, I can take the time to pause and be kind to myself here. And I can sit here and say, I am really doing my best. I am doing as well as I can do. And I can forgive myself for the moments that I don't feel great about. And, I, and you can stay as long as you want, but when you're ready, you can get up slowly can look around, take one more look at this beautiful surrounding, maybe one more fistful of sand, that beautiful white sand, or pick up a rock as you walk back on your path through the forest. And as you walk back in the distance, you see that beautiful door 
with that shiny doorknob that will always be there when you're ready to go back. And just picture your hand extending, turning that doorknob, opening that door. And now you're walking back through that hallway and it's still so beautiful and the pictures on the wall are so vibrant and so welcoming. And you will know that you have taken the time to be kind to yourself and that that beautiful place will always be available to you anytime you wanna go. So let's just take another couple breaths right here and come back together. Welcome. Wow, that was, uh, that was pretty powerful. I love that one. I don't usually do uh, visualizations like that. Um, I think I should start doing them. That was, that was pretty good. I felt like when you, you had us open the door, like the scene in my mind was in The Wizard of Oz when like Dorothy goes from black and white to color and she opens uh -huh. up and there's that explosion. That was kind of what I saw. <laughs> And what's what's beautiful about the meditation is every single one of us, no matter how many of us are on this call, had a different image. Right. And what's beautiful is it gets to be yours. And you can now go back to that place whenever you need to. So part of the reason I'm really, really, really excited to have you here today is because a lot of kids are like, I'm not into the meditation, into mindfulness. So you're bringing something completely above and beyond mindfulness that we're going to get to in a minute. Mm -hmm. um, but what I want to do is I want to share with you like uh, kind of like a weather check of like how the students are doing because we did a couple polls. Sure. So this is where they're feeling this week. Which emotions trouble you the most during COVID? So I found this interesting. 50% said sadness. Half. Wow. Right. Wow. And then equal, it was the rest is divided equally. Roughly 13%, 12.5% said anger, 12.5% said grief, which of course is closely associated to the sadness. 12.5% said anxiety, and another 13% said fear. Mm -hmm. So this is who we're speaking to right now. I asked the question, do you believe that emotions can cause chronic pain or illness? Right, because not everybody's going to buy this, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, and these kids are no BS. They want to call things out. They want to know what's real. So, fifty percent said yes, resounding fifty. Thirty-seven and a half percent said maybe, and then only twelve and a half said no, flat out. Okay, I can handle that. <laughs> um, do you notice that pain is worse when you are under under stress? Thirty-eight percent said maybe. Another thirty-seven and a half percent said yes. And 25% said no. Okay. So this is what we're speaking to. Um, let's go back to what you said before. I found it very interesting. You put in one basket things like migraine headaches, back aches, and anxiety. Yes. So what do you mean by this? Anxiety seems to be like an emotional thing and a backache seems to be a physical thing. What are you talking about, Nicole? Okay. So I know this sounds hard to believe. And I probably wouldn't believe it myself if I hadn't been watching people cure for the past 20 years from the most extreme things. And I want to put it out there so you guys understand. I'm talking about I have clients that come to me in motorized wheelchairs and they now run marathons. I have clients who come to me with the kind of panic disorder that leads them to be agoraphobic, which means you're scared to leave your house, that are now full time, they travel for work, they jump on planes. So this is incredible transformations. And, and of course, it goes down to the much more um, calm, you know, smaller cases as well. So it's a great question. I think for people understanding mind body medicine, it's a lot of times their first question. So I'm going to explain it like this. Sometimes we feel things in our hearts. And sometimes we feel things in our bodies. And what I've learned over the many years of doing this work is that that's literally interchangeable. So I'm going to give you an example. What I'm teaching is something you already believe. So sometimes I'm talking to a lecture hall of people and I say, raise your hand if you've ever had a stressful day and you get a headache. Every single hand goes up. You know, did you go? Oh, I say, okay, thank you for sharing. Did you go and get a brain MRI the next day because you thought you had a brain tumor? And everybody laughs, of course not. I just had a stressful day and I got a headache. I had an emotional stimulus that caused a physical reaction. 
And I'm like, okay, okay, let's go to the next question. Did you ever get bad news and all of a sudden your stomach went sick? You know, you just felt that that tightness in your stomach or that tightness in your chest. And everyone's like, yeah, of course. You know, if your phone rings at two in the morning and it's your mom, you know, Ooh! you know, like it's a physical reaction, but it's not caused by a physical stimulus. It's caused by an emotional stimulus. It's caused by seeing someone's phone number on your phone that maybe you don't want to hear from right now or you're scared they have bad news for you. You know, uh, a, a comic, you ever hear of like a stand up comic who goes and throws up before he has to go on stage? He's not check being checked out the next day for stomach cancer or anything horrible wrong with his stomach. He was really scared and he threw up. It's normal. People always believe that you could have a physical reaction from an emotional stimulus. But when things get chronic, like anxiety, which is also oftentimes manifested physically, heart palpitations, headaches, shortness of breath, um, headaches in terms of migraines, fibromyalgia, which is another word for nerve pain, back pain, um, irritable bowel disease, stomach aches. That is just the chronic version from chronic stress and repressed anger and sadness, which is what a lot of people are going through right now in COVID. And so I guess what people are just starting to understand as consciousness is raising and people are becoming more open to this is that our emotional worlds, which we always believed caused our physical symptoms on that smaller level, are actually ruling our symptoms. And the way it comes through each diff person is different. So similar to our meditation, where each of us probably had a very different image of this beautiful setting, every one of us is gonna have a different expression of our repressed emotions rising. Sometimes people who are prone to headaches, that's gonna be their weak spot. They're gonna be headache people. Some people are gonna be stomach ache people. I mean, I'm talking to kids right now. So many kids have headaches and stomach problems. So many kids have anxiety issues. These are just a few really common ways that the emotional world can be felt through the physical body. Funny you should say that. There's an 11th grader who asked the question, ever since I was young, I would get migraine headaches. I've noticed that they happen when I am under a lot of stress and they've been getting worse in isolation. I don't know if there is a connection. What can I do about it? Absolutely. So what we're going to talk about today, and I don't want to jump too far ahead, but what we're going to talk about today with the journal speak practice and the things that I teach is an excellent way to get rid of migraines. But I think that it's important to say that my work has three facets, believe, do the work, and patience and kindness for yourself. And the reason I put believe first is because this is a really new concept to a lot of people. And so if they if I can't get them into my sphere of belief where they really understand this is no kidding, capital T truth kind of stuff. This is not I'm a therapist and I'm coming in with some hippy dippy, let's feel better stuff. This is real brain science. This is when your nervous system and your brain are in a sustained fight or flight situation, which so many of us are right now in the current landscape. It will be expressed through your body, which is, of course, why migraines get worse under stress. So the first thing I would need to help that student would to be to to bring he or she through and, and have them understand you got to believe it for the work to have effect on you, because if you keep yourself in a state of fear and in a state of feeling like something's wrong with you, your nervous system is still going to be up here with the fight or flight. And what we're trying to do is bring you from fight or flight to rest and repair. So can I, can I, can I cut you off? A little? So yes. fight or flight is right. It's like your nervous system's primal way to protect you, to keep you safe. Right? So like a thousand years ago, if you were living with cavemen or 10,000 years ago, or whatever, and there was a bear that was going to eat you, it would send like your heart beating and blood rushing to your limbs in order to either a fight the bear and live or flee and run the fl so this is what your nervous system is always trying to do is that correct yeah absolutely and it's and it's operating under the level of your consciousness and so let me i'll give a little example because you just opened up a great place to give an example of this so let's pretend we're like early caveman woe man and we come out of our caves and i look to my left and i see a saber-toothed tiger my nervous system immediately without my permission without asking me my opinion, is gonna go into a state of fight or flight. Why? Because if I, as a human being, had any sort of opinion about that, maybe I would say, oh, Fluffy, let's go give it a pet. And then there'd be no human race. You know, we're built to survive. Our most basic human 
purpose is to stay alive. And the primal brainstem, the primitive brainstem, which is at the base of our spine, uh, well, base of our, our brain, you know, our neck, is the same as it was in, and this is a scientific fact, in early man, that basic fight or flight limbic nervous system, it's the same. And so when we have a repressed emotion, so let's talk about if you have an anger, anger issues. So many teens have anger issues because they feel no control over their lives. And that anger starts to rise. Well, that makes the nervous system feel really unsafe. That's like a predator. That anger rising is like the, the saber tooth tiger. It starts coming. And because we're taught in this society that it's not acceptable to be angry, it's not acceptable to cry in front of others, it's not acceptable to have a panic attack in front of your friend group or whatever it is that might happen, the nervous system clicks into fight or flight mode and it says, what's safer than this anger rising? And then it picks a headache, a back pain, a stomach ache, and you can understand why it would be safer to have a stomach ache or a headache because then you're gonna lie down or you're gonna not go to school that day and the dangerous world that the nervous system is protecting you from is no longer a predator. Does that make sense? It does and there's the way I explain it sometimes is that there's, a, there's like a genetic flaw where the nervous system can't tell the difference yes. between a physical threat and an emotional threat. That's so right. if I'm a kid and I'm in an apartment and I'm worried that my dad or mom might lose their job, my nervous system can't tell the difference between a bear that wants to eat me. Correct? Yes, absolutely. And another thing that's really important for, for people to understand is the human animal is the only animal that is capable of having our thinking world be more real than the world right in front of us. So if we get in our own head and we start worrying about things that are happening and maybe projecting forward, like if my mom or dad loses their job, maybe we're going to lose our apartment, then what are we going to do? That is can be more real than the, than the thing right in front of you, which is today I'm fine. And that can send your whole system into this panicky fight or flight mode. And I say all this to help people believe in order to bring them to the work that will heal them. I don't wanna make it sound like, oh, we're just, you know, we're all out of luck and you know, this is what's happening and there's no solution. There's a tremendous solution when people understand how important it is to safely feel our feelings. So what's part of that solution when, when someone is in this kind of situation? What, how do you work with them? So I've done a lot of research over the years, um, both through my own personal work on myself and through my work with clients, that the easiest way and the most powerful and effective way to safely feel our feelings at the pace that we can hear them and integrate them is through journaling. And I know that we talk, you know, kids probably hear about journaling a lot, but I've created a program called Journal Speak, which is a little different than regular journaling. So do you want me to dive right into that? Go for it. Go. Okay. So Journal Speak is like, have you ever been around a five-year-old and they're having a tantrum? I'm sure you have. Yeah. Uh, maybe you have one in your house right now. And when a five-year-old is, is, has a big feeling He's not worried about what, how he's going to make other people feel with his big feeling. And he's not worried about being embarrassed or making a scene. And he's not worried about consequences even in the moment. He's just going to scream and punch and kick until he gets what he wants. And that's normal. But the problem is that kind of a feeling is still happening in us as we get older. But as we get older, society tells us what it is to be acceptable. And that's important. We can't be screaming and kicking and punching in the grocery store. It wouldn't work. But what happens is those big feelings exist anyway. And they happen inside of us. And these are the feelings that build up and build up and cause us to feel physically anxious or physically full of pain and symptoms. And so journal speak is a practice where we take 20 minutes we set our phones or our timers for 20 minutes, turn it over and don't look at it so you're not watching it count down. And you take 20 minutes to tell the raw, unfiltered, tantruming five-year-old effing truth. And you got to do it with your whole self, with your energy, with your heart, with your anger, with your fear. And when you do it, at the 20-minute mark, your phone's going to go off, you delete it. This is, this is literally a brain dump. And when you do this, and I can give them obviously more structure within which to do this, what you're doing, if you picture that you have an emotional reservoir in your 
chest and in your stomach. Right now it's overflowing. Right now we have COVID and all the things, all the pressures of, of life. We take a ladle into that. We take a big spoon and we're just dumping it out. Every day we do our journal speak practice. And as the reservoir gets lower, we're not getting triggered anymore into panic, into anxiety, into headaches and stomach aches. It literally just stops happening. And what, what I would encourage you guys to do, the student who has the question, but all of you, is do a science experiment on yourself. Try the practice and see how it begins to transform your life. And then what I do say, and I'm sure Mr. Simmons will agree with this, following the 20 minutes, I love for people to sit just for 10 minutes in any kind of a loving kindness meditation for yourself. You can walk down your hallway and go to your safe place or anything that speaks to you because it's just about letting it out and then bringing yourself back to yourself. So when I hear you say this, uh, I'm not only the dean of the school, I'm, I'm also an English teacher. So as an English teacher, when I first heard this, I was like, yeah, people journal, they write all the time. What's the big deal? People who, ha who own a journal aren't necessarily getting cured of things. What's the big story with this? Added to that as a person who's meditated for like over 21 years, going on long-term meditation retreats, I believed I could see every single thing that was going on inside of me because I was so concentrated. When I tried this experimentally, I was blown away like, whoa, I didn't know I actually felt this way about this situation. And when I brought it to the kids as an option on one day, I said, hey, "Here's, let's just try this out, guys. I, I want to do something with you. Every week after that, the kids would ask me, can we do this journal speak? Yeah. So... Um, we have a student with us right now. I think he's got a question. Um, unless you wanted to add more to that, Nicole. No, no, no. I'm up. happy to take a question. Damien, um, unmute yourself and hey, hey. Um, okay. My question is that um, actually, I have to say something first. Um, my dad is a lieutenant for EMS, and he's always on the front lines all the time during this whole um, quarantine stuff and my brother works in a supermarket so he's always around many people yeah so i was gonna ask you what am i supposed to do with this fear that they could get sick or and because it's more likely for them to get sick then and then if they get sick then i come in contact with them too so that means it's, that i'm more yeah. likely to go um like hurt one of my friends if i go see them so that's a really awesome question, Damien. Thank you for bringing that up. So here's what I want to say about this. And this applies not only to you, but to all of us in living in our own powerlessness. Because what's scary about life is we can't control other people's outcomes. We can't control the world outside of us. And it makes us feel really scared. So obviously, we know that your dad has to go to work, your brother has to go to work, and you have to live in your apartment. So those are three givens that are not going to change. What you can change though, what we can always change is what's happening in here. So let's say you were to take your a half hour of your day, which sounds like nothing, but it does feel like really hard once you try to do it. So you have to overcome your own resistance and you have to kind of talk to yourself and say, I'm doing this even though I don't feel like it. And you write at the top of a piece of paper or you type at the top of a document, I'm scared for my father, I'm scared for my brother, and I'm scared for me. Just whatever sentence would encapsulate your question. And then for 20 minutes, you tell the truth, but I'm talking about the truth, and I'm gonna make some stuff up right now because I'm not you, but I'm talking about the truth that is deeper and uglier than maybe you let yourself go to. Because what you're gonna do by doing this is you're going to save a little piece of yourself there are two things that can benefit you. First of all, it will, it's going to bring your nervous system into rest and repair. So all the functions of your body are at tip top shape when you're not feeling your anxiety up to here. So for example, when your anxiety is high, and we all know this, our, our, um, our immune systems are suppressed. So actually, for Damien, you're less likely to get sick if you do this practice because your immune system is no longer... Um, having to work so hard to also fight your stress. But basically what happens when you do this is you tell the unabashed truth. So things like, um, I'm terrified. I, I think about it all the time. 
I, I worry, you know, talking about the details of your worry and then also talking about shame. I think a lot of times we feel shame when we're, you said something like you, um, you worry then if you saw your friends that you would expose them, that kind of shame you talk about. And it's just a really, it's like a, an ability to get those big feelings out of you. And I know it sounds like it might not matter, but what happens, as Mr. Simmons was saying, is it really starts to matter. You start to realize you had feelings about things that you didn't even know. And even though we can't control other people's outcomes, we start being able to make ourselves healthier, which truly in the end is all we can control anyway. So Damien, um, to, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, how do you feel about that? Uh, thank, yeah, that actually like, um... I was actually really thinking about it when you were actually talking about it and about like the journaling and stuff. And I have done it with Simmons a couple of times and everything. And it has helped because, and I remember asking for it every single Friday last semester. Um, <laughs> just try and, it. You know, it's just, it's, it's like, do like literally almost try it with curiosity. I wonder how I would feel if I do this every day. I wonder, you know what you can do? Take a little fear inventory today. Right. So like, be like, how scared am I about this, this, and this, or whatever? And you mark it like between one and 10, 10 being the worst. And then do the journal speak practice for a week and then do your inventory again. Just, so, you know, see how you feel. So here's an important part of it, Nicole. Um, and Damien knows this because when we did it in class, you know, when, we, when you look at journaling from a traditional viewpoint, a lot of times people have a journal and it's like this thing they want to enshrine. I'm right. the, I'm going to write down my journal so 10 years from now I can remember it. This is not that. This is saying we're going to dump out all of this poison onto the page and then we're going to get rid of it. So for like an example is like when we do it in class, every kid has their paper, we set a timer, and then when the 20 minutes goes up, I walk around with a, with a garbage pail, everyone tears it up, throws yeah. it, like don't even read it don't believe it. It may not even be true. It doesn't even stay true. You know, I have a client who says, um, and she says it more crassly, but I'm going to be PG. She says, listen, this is like blowing your nose or going to the bathroom. Just flush it. Like this is, this is, this has nothing to do. I almost hesitate to use the word journal in it because right. it's not traditional journaling. It is a therapeutic method of, like you said, bringing literal toxins out of our body. And this is sometimes, I mean, the name of your book is The Meaning of Truth. But you're talking about like the truth of how I really feel right now, which may be inconsistent with what yes. is polite to say or even what I, what I want to be aware of myself. So let me give you a little example because that might, this might really help. So when I was having my horrible, horrible back pain and I went and met Dr. Sarno at NYU and I, and I learned about his program intimately and I started to do it and I started to journal – who is Dr. Sarno, though? Oh, I don't okay. Dr. Dr. Sarno is my mentor. He passed away a few summers ago at the age of 94. But for 50 years, he was an attending physician at the Rusk Center for Rehabilitation at NYU Medical Center. And he was the one who, who created this theory of something called TMS, which is just stands for tension myositis syndrome. But it's an umbrella under which all this mind body illness exists everything that can manifest itself through our bodies which is honestly almost everything it's the explanation of why we experience emotional stimuli as physical sensations whether they be anxiety depression or or pain and so when i had my worst pain incident i actually when he was practicing i saw him in new york and he was able to explain to me this whole process that I'm explaining to you. And when I sat down to do my journaling at the time, um, I had already cured my back pain from reading his book years ago, but then I had a relapse of pain when my son was 10 months old because I was living in tremendous fear that maybe I had not, there was something actually structurally wrong with me. You know, this is a, this is a process. Recovery is not a straight line. And so when I went and met him, I was journaling about motherhood. So this is, this is an example of when you were saying like, does the thing even stay true? You know, so I'm journaling about motherhood. And at the time I had a 10 month old and like a two and a half year old. I was really overwhelmed. And so I'm writing things in my journals or my journaling, like um, I'm really tired and um, the babies, you know, they're, they're taking up so much of my energy. I was writing things that were true 
on the surface, but they weren't the kind of truth that heals. And I started writing and I'm writing and I'm writing and I got this moment, sort of this awakening. And I said, this is not what's going to get rid of my back pain. Like this is not. And I sat for a minute and I got the bravery to write what I really felt at the moment. And I wrote, I hate being a mother. And I can't explain to you the gravity of that because you don't know me the way like you would have to know me to understand the bomb that that set off in the middle of my heart. Because not only did I want to be a mom since I was 10 years old, but I was told when I was 19, I would never have biological children. And I overcame every odd to have these kids. And then I just was having this moment where I'm like, I hate it. And I didn't understand why. But I had to write it in order to open the door to understand why. And then all this stuff started coming up. And I'm writing and I'm writing about how I'm not cut out for this. And I thought this was going to be easy and it's hard. And I thought pregnancy was going to be fun. And I was sick the whole time. And, and I'm writing and I'm writing. And what started to rise in me is it wasn't that I hated being a mother. There was tons of pain from my childhood that I needed to excavate. I needed to look at the way that I had been parented, the way that I decided I was going to fix my life by parenting someone one else better than I had been parented. It was deep. It was a lot. But when it started coming up, I really knew this is the stuff. This is the stuff that I would never have thought to talk about. And as soon as it came all the way out, none of it stayed true. I love being a mother. I have five kids now. My They're all teenagers. Like this is when they were little. I have been such a better parent to them because I haven't parented them through the lens of my own crap. I've parented them as who they are. And so it's not just a gift in terms of pain. This is a gift in terms of living your life clean, living your life as who you are. So just to really break it down on a granular level, your nervous system was protecting you from seeing these feelings that were too threatening to you. You didn't want to think, I don't want to be a mom. You didn't even want to look there. So yeah. to protect you, give Nicole back pain and she doesn't have to think about how stressful being a mom is. Is that correct? Absolutely. The back pain was seen as a far lesser predator than the darkest thing you can imagine me say. First of all, how dark is it to say I hate being a mother when I have these two little kids that I have to raise for the rest of their lives? And second of all, I'm trapped. <laughs> you know, I mean, this is the thing. Our nervous system sees trapped and they say, you can't survive this if you hate this. You're not going to make it then. You may as well be dead. So let's just have the back pain because the back pain will divert you from feeling these feelings. But here's the miracle of that moment that I want everyone to know. I woke up the next morning and my back pain was gone and it's never returned. Mm. ever. And this is me with a spinal condition so severe that it makes orthopedic surgeons go pale. When they look at my MRI, you throw it up on the screen, they go, Ooh! you know, I mean, it's my, my, my structural abnormality was never the reason for my pain. Dr. Sarno often called them normal abnormalities. Bulging discs don't cause pain. This is something I've learned over and over in my work. And so it's just about relearning a lot of the things that we've been taught. And just so we're clear for people watching, this is not like, you know, some 19 year old um, person met a doctor and she found benefit and okay, great. That's like one story. Dr. Sarno is like a New York Times bestselling author of yes. multiple books, Five Healing books. Back Pain, The Divided yes. Mind, like classics, millions and millions of, of, of yes. copies and thousands and thousands of people being cured in this kind of way. Yes. Plus, since he's passed away the past few years, there are now neuroscientists who are testing this, yes. right? Yes in a variety of different ways. And some of them came together, like as one example, like there's an app out there called Curable that was like developed by neuroscientists that are actually, they're demonstrating this in a lab. It's not just like your opinion about it. Like they're, they're, is this true? This is 100% true. I'm also an advisor for Curable and I love that app. And I, I yes, it's 100% true. This is why I often say, and I sort of um, intimated earlier, if this were me being a therapist, with like a lovely hippy dippy kumbaya, let's all hold hands and feel better. Wouldn't that be nice? It would still be nice. But what this is, is brain science. This is serious. This is as important as any other medical science that you could study because this is what is causing people to be sick and it's being replicated in studies over and over right now.
So what are some examples? I know the kids were asking, what are some examples of your patients where you've seen people get cured? I know you had a famous patient named Olivia who had like this remarkable, what are some like stories that you've seen? Do you want me to talk about Olivia? Uh, if you want to, sure. Yeah, that one was crazy. So she was a senior in college. She had just been accepted into veterinary school, which is really, really hard to get into. And one day she just got a headache and it never went away. And it got worse and worse and worse. And then it became not just a headache, but a facial pain. And it felt, she said, like a like hundred pound boulder was sitting on her face and her whole, her whole head and face just pulsed with pain day and night. It never ended. And her family became totally distraught, as you might imagine. And she was put into hospitals. She was for over a year hospitalized in and out of different states being transferred from one state to the next suicidal, but beyond hope, they, they flew her in a last ditch effort to um, South Africa. And she was undergoing experimental treatments. They were going through her mouth and injecting into the nerves in her face, cutting the nerves. The whole thing was so barbaric. So finally, when nothing worked, her hair was falling out. She was emaciated and thin. They flew her back to Chicago and she was just in suicide watch on her parents' couch at the, at the age of 22. She discovered Dr. Her, her stepdad discovered Dr. Sarno's work, found her a physician at Northwestern Hospital in Chicago who was practicing his medicine, who's also, um, by the way, on the curable team, Dr. John Strax, who referred into my practice. So John referred her to me. Her parents flew her to where I live, and she actually lived in a hotel in my town. And I saw her for two weeks got her sort of what I'm telling all you guys today, got her set in her belief, got her set in her journal speak practice, got her set in understanding the imperative that she felt the pain of her childhood. She had a horrible um, situation with her alcoholic mother. Her parents had a really bad divorce. She had eating disorder issues her whole life. So she needed to stop repressing that stuff. So that was- And the, and the stress of going into veterinarian school, I mean, which right. is massive. Yes. And she's also such a perfectionist because so many of us are holding herself to such a high standard, being her own worst critic. And so we started working together in April. She had um, deferred vet school for a year. So September was her next chance to start. And her original plan was she was going to start in September with all sorts of aids, like a note taker and all of these sort of disability benefits to try to at least do it. She... Um, did the journal speak work all summer. I saw her once a week. So it wasn't even like such intensive therapy. By, I get chills every time I tell this story. By September, she was full-time in vet school, no note taker, no aid. She did four years of vet school, pain-free, graduated top of her class. And now she's at the University of Pennsylvania studying emergency medicine in a residency. And she's incredible and amazing and free. And it's just, it's, it's mind-blowing to watch how this work heals people from being suicidal because of her physical pain. Yeah. So listen, you know, we have you know, we have a unique situation here in the world and in the school. We have kids who have been remote learning, trapped, cooped up in apartments. One girl told me last week that she has not left her apartment once since corona. You know, wow. this is a, this is a very stressful situation. At the same time, we have uh, high school seniors who are about to transition into the world with no fanfare, no real kind of ritual or anything. Yeah. So, and you know, your first year of college can be very, very, one of the most stressful times of your life. How would someone approach this practice? Like how would they, they want to start tomorrow. They want to do this, coach them through that. What do they do? Well, I think the first thing we have to do is we have to unlearn some portion of what we've learned. What we've been taught as kids is, Really, the only part of health that needs to be dealt with is if something is wrong with you, you go to a doctor, you get a pill, or you get stitches or whatever, and you fix it. The first thing that's important to know as you're entering into this, so let's just pretend you're talking about someone graduating, is your mental health, your quote unquote broken heart is as important to deal with as your broken arm, as important. And when we realize the, the just this is like no joke, when we realize the importance of this, that's the first step. Because we take, we will take it seriously. If your arm was broken in half, you wouldn't say, oh, screw it. I'll fix it in two weeks. You would go that day. So for people to understand the heaviness of what's going on right now and how important it is to care for themselves this way, that's the first step. The second step, and I have a lot of online resources. Most of them are free. There's so much to learn about what I do. 
just say to yourself, if this is as important as Nicole is saying, I'm going to give this gift to myself and do this practice. And then it's about setting aside a half hour of your day, even though this is not what you were taught is the most important thing to do for your health. It's, it's resetting that kind of expectation and doing the practice. And I think that people need to understand, and I was kind of saying this a little to Damien, resistance to the journal speak is part of the nervous system keeping you safe, keeping you away from your feelings. So you're going to find yourself saying, Ugh, I have something better to do, or I'm too tired, or I'll do it later. That's just your fight or flight response kicking up and saying, you don't want to go there. You don't want to know how you really feel about things. Say, thanks for sharing. We're going to do this now. You have to kind of talk to yourself that way because sometimes your resistance will take over and that's like, it's totally, it's not going to help, I guess is what I'm saying. So that's what I would say to people, give yourself the gift. And if you are willing to do the 10 minute meditation after your 20 minutes, it's only a half hour total obligation. You're done for the day. You rip it up and throw it out. You delete it off your computer and, and Mr. Simmons, that's actually really important for us to mention because we're talking about kids here who have Snoopy parents and who have brothers and sisters who could look through their stuff. You have to keep yourself safe and destroy it because journal speak is meant to be so free that other people won't understand it. You don't want your loved ones to read it. Do you think I would ever want my kids to read I hated being a mother? I mean, of course, now they know my whole story and they know how it healed me and they're so grateful for it. But at the time, if they had understanding of that, that would be very harmful. So we have to keep ourselves safe with our journal speak and make sure. I love to type it and just delete it. To me, that's the easiest way because now you know there's no trace of it. But if you like pen to paper, just rip it up, throw it into a public garbage can or throw it somewhere where no one's going to look at it. That's really important. And it actually does improve your relationships because this is the platform from which you can actually, as, as a, I've heard you say, win the argument. Yes. You can tell anybody off anything you want to say, you can get it out, but then you don't have to have like the cost and penalty of walking through life, telling people to go F themselves and all of this. Like you can do it on paper, done with it. Now you feel better and you didn't so lose true. a friend. It's so true. I mean, like, let's think about this right now. We're all stuck in our apartments with our parents. Okay. So let's say everybody's always in a bad mood sometimes and they take their bad mood out on somebody else. So let's say your dad, you know, does something really rude or like says a comment that's really insulting to you. And you know that if you go back at him, he's in a bad mood and you guys are going to get into a huge fight. You can go into your room and just write him a letter. It's a letter you will never send and just tell him everything you think, everything you feel, what you think about. And then what actually happens, at least for me a lot, is by the end of my journal speak, I come to a place of compassion. So like, let's say somebody took their stuff out on me. By the end of my journal speak, I start to see their side. I, once I've gotten all that anger and that ugliness out of me, I start to say, yeah, I know though. I know how hard you have it. I know what pressure you've been under. I understand why you might have lost your temper that way. But the best thing exactly as you said is next time I walk into the room with that person, I'm totally chill. I've already had my piece of whatever I had to say and they didn't really need to hear that anyway. And if they do need to hear a portion of it, I get to choose what I say. So that's another important thing that Journal Speak does for us. It helps us respond, not react, right? Do you ever teach your kids about responding, not reacting? Of course. Uh, yeah, all the time. Uh, Damien, go ahead. Damien, un I know you want to get in the conversation. Put your, your camera on. Um, I was just going to say that, like, when you're talking about, like, like you think before you speak, that's what, you, that's what you're trying to say with the yes. kids and everything. And I feel like, and you're talking about, like, how you write things down, how you actually, like, how you were going to respond, not um, how you're going to react, you write it down. So you don't just react, you respond to it. That's you don't right. Do that. But and then you also was talking about how how you how you get pain from how stressed you are. And, I, and then I was actually really thinking about it because my mom actually has lupus. And um, whenever she's stressed out is when her lupus reacts even more. And and she gets bedridden for a couple of days. This and, could be a great practice for your mom if she'd be open to it. I have a patient who had lupus. And she doesn't get the symptoms of lupus anymore, ever. 
yeah i was thinking about like talking to her about it because like i was like maybe it would help her because stress is the one that makes her react even more absolutely and and you know just because i can anticipate someone watching this and thinking wait a minute some conditions are physical and you're not saying that they're not right you're saying even if you have a bona fide physical condition even if you have cancer let's say you still are adding um adding more suffering to the symptoms by holding on to this emotional baggage. Well, uh, we can even take it sort of even at a wider lens. We live in a mind body system. When even if you just take a simple emotion like anger, if you're angry, you're going to walk into the world and the whole world's going to look different to you. It's going to feel like people are against you. It's going to you're going to be edgier with people. So, yes, this affects every condition. And I have worked with lots of people who had cancer. I, I worked through with a woman who had breast cancer through her entire treatment um, a couple of years ago. She was doing the journal speak regularly. She was meeting with me regularly. She came through this treatment. And I'm not saying that this would happen to everyone. It just happens to be what happened to this woman. Her hair didn't fall out. And we don't know why. Her doctor was like, this is so strange. Like it got a little thinner, but she never went completely bald. And he was like, all right. You know, I mean, th th sometimes there's no real even explanation for it, but it's like, it's another thing to say, you know, that cliche that even the best medical experts in the world only understand 6% of the human brain. Mm -hmm. The point is we are so powerful beyond anything that we even realize. Look at the concept of adrenaline. A mother can lift a car off her baby. You know, this has been documented time and time and time again. But if I want to go outside, no matter how hard I try, I can't lift my car. You know, this is the, the miracle of the human brain and the human body that we don't always understand. So I'm not saying I can cure cancer or I can cure lupus, but I am saying, because this is my real experience, I have a client who no longer gets the symptoms of her lupus for years. You know, I, I, I'm not projecting that I can cure lupus. I'm just saying this is real. This is what's happening in my practice. So I have to share that so people know that the life they save is their own and the power is theirs. So Nicole, as a licensed therapist, some of our kids are very, very real, very raw. Um, a 12th grader submitted this question mm -hmm. and said, aren't people who go to therapy or do these kinds of things weak because they can't solve their own problems? That's how I solve mine. How would you respond to this student? I just want to give them a big hug, <laughs> but I'm a mom. So forgive me, you know, listen, okay. Here's what I would say to him. You know, when you're hanging out with your friend, that's like your favorite person to hang out with. What's the best moment you ever have with that person. And I can promise you what he would say is a moment where I really see them a moment where maybe they make fun of themselves a little, or they get like, I, I get a little sense of like the warmth of them. We connect, you know, we have a laugh and those, ah, yeah, well, that's just him. Those moments of human connection are moments that are, that are gotten through vulnerability. People think vulnerability or is weakness. People think that when we show our, our true colors, when we put down our weapon and we just stand there that we're weak, but that's the time you like people the best. That's the time that there's this spark of love and connection between you and somebody else when they're just when they're not trying to be so strong and tough guy and I got it, I got it. The time we love people the most is when they say, I don't got it. Can you help me? What a beautiful moment that is. I think that it's just, you know, the reason that people choose um, a, a, a tough shell exterior rather than vulnerability is because vulnerability feels unsafe. And that's legitimate. A lot of people aren't safe to be vulnerable with. But when you start doing this practice, nobody's looking but you. You can be as vulnerable as you want because it's totally safe. And as you start feeling more comfortable with that, maybe you take a little bit more risk with the people that you trust and you get more human connection. It just brings you more happiness. And that's really just what therapy is. You know, therapy is just allowing yourself to get some help. And I know it feels like it's weak, but it's actually our greatest strength. So you're saying that journal speak is a safe area to, to be vulnerable, where if people maybe not everyone has people around them that they, that they trust, even right. family members sometimes. But in this journal speak, you can be vulnerable and you can be scared and you can be all of those things that you may not be allowed to be socially for the rest of the day. And it will, yes, and it will change you. So like, 
let's say this person asking this question would love to have a girlfriend or would love to have a better connection with his girlfriend or would love to have a closer relationship or more friends. I mean, wouldn't we all love to have these things or, you know, would love to have more respect from the people around him, whatever. Doing this and allowing ourselves to be vulnerable just in the in the safety of our own personal experience it starts to bleed off onto the other parts of our life in the best possible ways. And so all of a sudden, you, you're having the strength and the power to connect more with people. It's just phenomenal. You have to try it to know. It's like you believe it when it happens inside of you. And I know that you have a lot of celebrity clients. Um, so they have like a pretty big image, a pretty big profile. Are celebrities more immune to this? Are they happier people? Are they less insecure than a kid at home looking at social media and thinking, oh man, I'm not as important as these people are as beautiful or as whatever? Oh my God, no. The celebrities are the most messed up people I work with. <laughs> um, listen, celebrities are, I'm not even going to say they're worse. They're just normal. One of the worst parts about working with celebrities is I realized there's really nothing to celebrity other than they get a little bit more freedom because they have a lot of money and they have a lot of choices, but everyone's just human. We're just all soft, chewy human centers, you know? And when you said earlier about during the journal speak that your brain sometimes will actually try to divert you away from it, I've noticed it myself, where if I have some sort of like immune systems, I know a couple of years ago I had strep throat for the whole, and it clearly had some sort of emotional component to it. I would sit down and I would start to do it, and all of a sudden my symptoms would like intensify. And I'm like, huh, that's strange. Why when I start writing down, is it worse? It was trying to stop me from doing it, right? Because I didn't want to see these things. Well, yeah. And also, if you think about it, um, and this is something I say really often in my practice, life is a choice between what hurts and what hurts worse. Every single situation comes down to a choice between what hurts and what hurts worse. And on its face, you might think that that sounds negative, but it's actually a tremendous relief. It helps us understand what acceptance means, because then we're not constantly fighting for a situation to be perfect. You know, everything comes down to a choice between what hurts and what hurts worse. And so in terms of your situation that you're talking about, you're excavating some sort of truths, you know, you're bringing it up and your nervous system is saying, no, 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 no. I think it hurts worse to look at these feelings. Let's up the symptoms. Let's up the symptoms. Let's, let's get you thinking that maybe there's something else you should be doing. Let's get you so tired. There have been times where I'm journal speaking and I literally almost fall asleep on my keyboard. I'm like, because I can see what my nervous system's doing. It's saying, no, 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 danger, danger. It hurts less to be sick. Let's just be sick. And I say, nope, Nope, we're doing this now. I finish my journal speak, I erase it, and then it starts to feel better because we just have to realize that we're empowered. We're empowered to walk through this. And our nervous system is, is like, our nervous system is also like a little kid. It's like five years old. The mentality of our nervous system is like five years old. So when you hear it screaming at you, it's like letting yourself be bossed by a five-year-old all day. Like nobody would do that. But when we don't understand that dynamic, sometimes we can start to fall for it. And a 10th grader asked a question um, about test anxiety. She says, I have a lot of test anxiety whenever I take an important test, like the regions or other tests. My heart starts racing and my mouth gets dry and I can't focus. How can I get control of this? So if you haven't journal speak or even if you had and you're in a, like a moment of truth there where you have to perform and you're melting down, what can a person do? Well, I actually think that that goes more into your wheelhouse than mine. In the very moment when it's an acute reaction in your body, I think going back to your breath. Mm. I think that's less to do with the journal speak and more to do with bringing your heart rate down, connecting. You know, I love the, um, the breathing exercise where it's, you know, you breathe in for a certain amount of beats, hold for a certain amount of beats and exhale for just a little bit longer than you breathed in, you know, to try to calm down. So that I think is a bit more. Um, do you agree with that? Yeah, we had uh, Jay Michelson from 10% Happier Meditation yeah, yeah. app, and he did something called box breathing, where he actually added a component to it where he actually had us hold ourselves like under here. And then it was breathe in for four, hold for four. And there was something about the physically holding that 
it really like completely calmed the nervous system down. Yeah, I would say to her, that is a really important thing. And to realize how great that is in transforming the moment. And Oscar is a 12th grader. He says, what can I do to, to calm down and get a good amount of sleep? But I think I know where you're going to go with this. The journal speak helps with that, right? Yeah, you know, okay, so this is the thing. Life is a marathon, not a sprint. We have to realize that everything we do matters. And so if you're looking to have something like better sleep, which is a daily thing, you have to realize that doing a daily practice starts improving that little by little. So if I have a migraine disorder, and let's say I get a migraine three days a week, I start my journal speak practice. Maybe a few weeks into it, I'm realizing I'm getting a migraine two days a week. Maybe a few more weeks into it, I'm realizing, wow, it's been like a week and I haven't gotten a migraine. You know, that's the same thing with sleep. As you do this and you start taking out this anxiety and these toxins, little by little, like you're, let's say you wake up three times a night, you're going to go to sleep one night and one, you're going to wake up and it's going to be like four or five in the morning. You'll be like, oh my God, I actually slept like six hours before I woke up. That kind of thing. You know, it's just, it's, it's a change that has to do with making sure you take care of yourself and then it gives and gives. So, Nicole, this has been uh, incredibly helpful, incredibly beneficial, and I'm going to make a prediction here. Nicole is a visionary. She is way ahead on something, and in the years to come, the whole medical model is going to be turned upside down. It's a prediction, and Nicole is going to be at the, at the head of this. I'm, I have a good instinct on these things. You're going to see a lot more of her in the years to come. Um, before Wait, before we go. Um, <laughs> Before we go, um, Damien, if you want to speak, turn your, your camera on. Um, before we go, can I just ask you something? You remember how you were doing the meditation and everything? Yes. And, and you were talking about the hallway and everything, and it's a brightly lit hallway and everything. And then you go towards the door and open it up. But when I was going through the like meditation, I just wanted to uh, bring it up because this is what happened to me. I don't know if it happened to anyone else. But when I try to get closer and closer to the door, it went farther and farther away. Ah, all right. And, and then once I got close and then the door just started and then I lifted, I started lifting my arm to open the door. The, my arm started stretching and stretching and like the door went farther and farther away. I think that's really an interesting um, description of what happened and a reflection on it. I think that maybe you're a little scared. This is how I would interpret it you're a little scared that maybe this won't be available to you, right? Like we all have that feeling sometimes like, oh, it might be available to other people, but not for me. And our own fear keeps us from it. If you would do that, if you did that meditation in a few days, you're going to start to get right to that door. Okay. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you, Damien. And Nicole, um, you covered a lot of ground today. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to leave us with? Anything you'd like to tell the kids, the adults watching? I guess I just want to say to you guys that you have so much more power than you realize to affect your health. I, I love to talk to big groups of people. I love to look them in the eye and say, just be curious enough. Replace your fear with curiosity. Say, I wonder what would happen if I learned about this. I wonder what would happen if I tried this because this is your life. And you have so much more control than you realize and so much more power than you realize. And I just want people to give themselves the gift of being curious. And we want to thank you for this, uh, the nuggets of gold you gave us. And also, Nicole, thank you so much for not dropping any F-bombs on here. If you're I'm listening really trying. Yeah, very well done. Very good self-restraint. If you listen to Nicole's podcast, The Cure for Chronic Pain, she uh, embodies journal speak and truth telling. It just comes right out of her. It's very entertaining. You can look that up, The Cure for Chronic Pain. Nicole, thank you so much. It was such a pleasure to have this time with you today. Thanks for having me, Brian.